I'm Tracy Watts. Welcome to Mercer Health News. Our topic today is addressing continued health benefit cost growth. And my guest today is Mara Colley. Mara is a senior partner at Mercer. She's based in Chicago, and she leads our team of consultants that work with large and jumbo employers. Hi, Mara. Welcome, and thank you for being here. Thanks, Tracy. I'm happy to be here. So, Mara, according to our survey, employers are expecting the third consecutive year of health benefit cost increases above 7%, just as the starting out point for planning. So now that that number is out there, I I just have to ask you, you know, how are conversations with employers going and how are they reacting to this third year in a row of cost increases at this level? So I think that official result is in line with what we see um, employers planning for 2025. That's seven-ish percent before making changes. I think the other thing that we're seeing is employers understand that macro environment. So aging population, we've had a lot of uh, cost growth in wages and healthcare workers, continuing consolidation of health systems. So higher cost therapies coming onto the market. There's nothing in what I'll call our actuarial crystal ball over the next few years saying that trend is going to be anything underlying trend other than, you know, six to eight percent. And employers are understand this and are responding by implementing multiple strategies. They know that there isn't a silver bullet. And so they're focused on, you know, pulling a lot of different levers. So as we think about all of those different levers, what strategies are employers focusing on? So again, not just one strategy, you know, it's kind of pulling, pulling levers wherever they're at. Right. But I would say one of the main ones is network strategy. And we see employers really embracing things such as high performance networks, variable copay plans. An example would be a surest or a coop and other approaches that steer towards quality and efficiency. So that could be, I'm going to put in a program that has all my knee, hips, backs, et cetera, any of those focused on going towards a center of excellence. So those network strategies. Um, And I think our strategy survey that we completed this year showed that only about a third of employers aren't either, haven't either implemented or implementing for 25 or 26 some sort of alternative network approach. And I think as we get to this time next year, we'll see that third, you know, decrease even further. So network strategy is really a big one. We also see employers focusing on optimizing their overall spend. So we've put in a lot of programs over the last five years to meet the needs of a diverse workforce, as well as I'll call them condition-specific strategies. So things, you know, musculoskeletal, what are their overall programs looking like there? And we're now seeing employers kind of step back and say, okay, we need to make sure we're getting value for all of these things that we've put in place. And so what are those metrics that say this program is successful? You know, and is it Do I get that in year one, year two, year three? And really thinking about, and I'll call it that measurement strategy. And what are those leading and lagging indicators that are saying this program is working? And if it's not, are there tweaks or changes that we need to make? Or do we need to go out and look and see what else is available in the market that may meet this need? Again, that focus on not putting something in, it's one and done, but that it's a continuous optimization uh, cadence. Actually, I think the other thing that sometimes happens with um, all the programs that get added is that there may be some overlap here and there, and just making sure that you don't have conflicting places where people can go to begin with, because that that leads to confusion. But also that you're really focused and targeting your programs so that you're not paying for that, you know, in multiple places as well. Um, so, in addition to those strategies, what about pharmacy? Yeah, pharmacy is definitely top of mind. So 
Um, it's the single highest area of cost growth. And there's been a lot in the press recently about pharmacy. So um, we definitely see more employers digging into the pharmacy pricing approach used by their PBMs, you know, understanding how generics are priced, how brands are priced, et cetera. So implementing new, new terms and also looking at alternative pricing models. So transparent PBMs. So that whole pharmacy piece of the pricing aspect. Then the other thing we're seeing on pharmacy is really their GLP-1 strategy, right? That was a really big area of cost growth in the past year. So making sure that we're thinking about longer term, what is our, our um, focus on GLP-1s and how do we make sure it's the right people that are getting the drugs and that um, it's as effective as possible. So things like prior authorization or holistic weight management programs. We want to take advantage of this potentially very powerful um, pharmaceutical in terms of our overall strategy, but making sure that we're being thoughtful about how do all those pieces fit together to give us the best um, outcome. And then the final area within pharmacy, I would say, is just specialty costs. And we've seen employers do things this year, for example, implementing uh, a formulary change that says if a biosimilar is available for a specialty medication, the biosimilar is our formulary selection. So rather than giving the choice of here's the brand name drug for that and here's the biosimilar, saying our formulary is based on the biosimilar. And, and, and I think maybe surprisingly, we've had a number of employers that have put that in place and haven't had employee noise. Employees kind of get that biosimilars, maybe making equating it to generics when that came, came into play. Um, and so that has been another big area of uh, pharmacy spend. So, you know, Mara, I'm thinking about um, the plan member and we know from research that we do with, you know, plan workers that healthcare affordability is a huge issue. Many people fear that they can't afford the care that they need for themselves and their family. And we know that affordability has been top of mind for employers as well. Is this still a concern? And can employers kind of continue to focus on this given the cost pressures that they're feeling? Yeah, I, th I think it's definitely still very top of mind, um, Tracy. And some of those cost management approaches that we just talked about, I think those support that whole idea of affordability, right? We need to bring that trend rate down to make it more affordable, both for the company and for our employees. I would say that we did see for 2025 um, a little more shift in employers making plan design changes. So increasing deductibles, co-pays, et cetera, to shift some of that increase to, to employees who are utilizing the plan and as a way to kind of minimize, right, the employee payroll deduction piece of it. So they also those network strategies, et cetera, we've seen employers implement new plan options. So it may be tied to a smaller network. It may be tied to needing your care coordinated via PCP. But what it what it gives is that the trade-off is that lower price point for employees. And, and we see those plans particularly attractive to lower lower wage workers. Okay. Um, well, that, that certainly makes sense, especially the copay plans and even the biosimilar strategy. You know, if you're paying coinsurance on a much lower cost, then, you know, that does help address the affordability issue. So um, this is a lot, you know, you've, you've offered a lot of really great ideas and suggestions. And so, you know, um, somebody might feel a little overwhelmed by this. What is your best advice for employers that are working on their strategies to address cost increases? I think the most important recommendation that I have is to look at your game plan over multiple years, right? Simply look, looking at the next plan year may cause you to not do something because, you know, the juice isn't worth the squeeze, right? 
Um, but what, when you look at that impact over multiple years, you get a very different picture, right? So as we work with clients, we try to get them to kind of focus on that multi-year roadmap. Here's what the status quo costs are for the next plan year, year two, year three, right? And then let's layer in strategies over that period of time to get you from, you know, the current plan year and keep, keep rolling out again, a three-year game plan. And so can you maybe give an example of why that's important to do and how we've kind of seen that manifest itself? Sure. I, I would say that, you know, a real simple example is some of the copay based plans. So we have uh, clients that have now had those in place three to five years. And year one, let's say with those plans, I get 5% enrollment. If I was just looking at that year, that might not be worth it to me. Right. But fast forward to year three, I'm now at 30% enrollment. And the costs per employee per year for that plan are 10% lower than the traditional approach, right? So you have to kind of have that you know, longer, um, longer runway and longer look to get to where you want to go, right? The communications that you need to do, the word of mouth that, you know, kind of spreads the word about a plan design or a program, Right. So having that multi-year focus um, really think makes it that you don't just focus on year one, but what, what is it going to look like year three? Yeah, I think that's a really important point to make, because if you knew going in, you were going to get, you know, small enrollment in the first year, you might not decide to do it. And um, that longer term view is really how you're going to see the payout. You know, the other thing too, Mara, is um, from our CFO survey, we know that they kind of have a different view of things. And so um, some advice there as well. Yeah, so th that's a really good point, Tracy. Um, I, I say you need to make sure you hold that CFO and your finance partners close and involve them in the process. You know, for I think in our CFO survey, we had about two thirds of CFOs indicate that healthcare cost growth was really significant or a, a very significant concern, right? So it's on their minds. The piece that was super powerful to me was that 94% of them felt that sustainable healthcare cost growth was something lower than what we're seeing in the market, that, that um, CPI plus three points or so. They're expecting it to be lower than that, right? So ensuring that and finance understands where healthcare cost is going, that multiple year picture, as well as here's our game plan for addressing it, right? Allows you to bring them into the conversation and and will minimize kind of knee-jerk or reactive stances from finance. So rather than being your adversary, help help them be champions for the changes that you're making. I think that's great advice. And um, I just so appreciate you being here today and sharing that and um, look forward to having you come back sometime again soon. Thanks, Mara. Thanks, Tracy. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.